This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Sign up for the Nebula Bundle deal at curiositystream.com slash ext to watch the third episode of Extremities right now before it releases to the public. At 5pm on December 31st, 2019, the MV Hazel McIsaac pulled away from Little Bay Islands. On board were the last few holdouts of those who had called the tiny island hamlet home. This would be the final time that the town's regular ferry service pushed off from the rustic collection of snow-dusted crimson, off-white, and beige saltbox homes. As it exited the protected harbour, the permanent population of Little Bay Islands plummeted from 54 to just 2. For those on board, and the two still standing on shore, the weight of the moment hung heavy in the air. Mike Parsons, who along with his wife Georgina decided to stay, said of the final days that a quote, palpable sadness had enveloped the islands. Although an all but inevitable conclusion, leaving hurt. This is nowhere, uh, there's nothing else there, you know. To, but uh, the still people got uh, for the love of the land where they're born on, I mean, you know, it is. As the ferry cut through the low hanging fog and faded away in the evening's dying light, and as the 2010s faded from present to past, a tiny town on a couple tiny islands closed a chapter of its story that had begun some 200 years prior. What was once a boomtown gone bust was now all but a ghost town. That day, electricity that had powered the H.L. Strong Academy, Aunt Edna's B&B, the two churches, and the dozens of hardly built homes wrapping around the harbour shut off. Unopposed by streetlights and the hum of habitation, night and its accompanying quiet settled over the town of Two, and Little Bay Islands became the eighth remote community in Newfoundland and Labrador this century to permanently relocate. The abandonment of Little Bay Islands, and the reason this small settlement existed in the first place, is enmeshed in the intertwined history, politics, and economics of the North Atlantic, all of which, across centuries of European settlement, have revolved around a rather nondescript fish. By the 2010s, Little Bay Islands, a name left plural to acknowledge the community straddling of both Little Bay and Mac Islands, was on its last leg. At its height, more than 500 called this small but bustling town nestled between the lush forest and rocky coast home. What brought people to Little Bay Islands and the coast of Newfoundland had little to do with what was on land, but rather what swam in the surrounding waters. But the reason why settlers, predominantly from Europe, came to Newfoundland and Labrador and populated the outports was because of the proximity to this, this lush resource of wild fish. And that continues to be the case. Beginning with the Paleo-Eskimo peoples arriving around 1000 BCE, then followed by the Little Passage peoples 2000 years later, indigenous hunter-gatherer societies were the first to recognize the wealth of Newfoundland's teeming coasts. Not long after the Little Passage peoples had arrived though, these waters became a bit busier. Northern and Western Europeans were next to identify the region's oceanic potential, and unlike contemporary explorers, they weren't there for God, but for cod. Simply put, uh, Cod, when, uh, in my time I grew up and, and previous to that, cod was king. Cod's prominence, its centrality to life in Little Bay Islands and Newfoundland more broadly, spans well beyond Wilfred's lifetime, going back not just generations, but centuries. When Norse sailors landed on Newfoundland hundreds of years prior to Columbus's crossing, they skirted from one cold, barren shore to the next with little more than the prevalent, easy-to-catch, high-in-protein fish to fill their caloric needs. For the Europeans that followed, cod didn't just represent a calorie-dense source of sustenance, but a resource with which they could turn a profit. Although British and Basque fishing ventures kept tight lips about their favorite spots, it's likely that enterprising vessels cut across the Atlantic alongside and even before Columbus and John Cabot in the 1490s. Once Cabot had come across Newfoundland though, the secret was out as the explorer exclaimed that these faraway waters were so well stocked that all one had to do was stick a basket in the ocean and it'd fill with fish. While the European explorers carried with them a penchant to exaggerate, Cabot's description of fishing in the Northwest Atlantic maps rather accurately onto the disposition of the Atlantic cod. An omnivorous bottom feeder, cod are both perpetually lethargic and ceaselessly hungry, and as such, gladly take bait and don't put up much of a fight once on a line. 
properly treated, cod keeps, too. And uh, cod, one thing about cod, was all, all salt, put under salt back there then. So, I mean, you could keep it for a long, long time, year, two years, three years if you want to. I don't know how long you could if you really need it. But usually it was cut, split, and salted, and then taken back uh, to England and Portugal and Spain. Countries that, as Catholic, were eager to find alternatives to warm-blooded meats during Lent. As the fish gained popularity across Europe, becoming a staple in markets in the 1500s, and appearing in the pages of Cervantes' Don Quixote, Zola's The Belly of Paris, and Dumas's Le Grand Dictionnaire de Cuisine, European settlements took root along the rocky shores of the continent's northeastern coast. These hardy, self-reliant coastal communities, now known as outports, drove the growth of Newfoundland from the 1700s onwards. Built on and around the water, Little Bay Islands, only accessible by boat, angling out at the rich waters of the Notre Dame Bay and the Grand Banks beyond, but hugging the fragmented and protective coast of Newfoundland, was the quintessential outport. The earliest census of Little Bay Islands dates to 1825, but some locals like Wilfred Bartlett believe that British fishers may well have established year-round habitation on the islands decades prior. Whether settled in the 1820s or the 1720s, Little Bay Islands embodies the era of fish-fueled European expansion. And without an abiding climate, or much in the way of arable land for agriculture like its southern relatives off of Cape Cod, Little Bay Islands, from its inception, would remain a strictly ocean-oriented economy. From the 19th century to the mid-20th, Little Bay Islands enjoyed a period of blissful stasis. By 1950, the town, along with the rest of Newfoundland, had become a part of Canada, had added a few more salt box homes, a couple new processing plants, and was sheltering more modern boats in its harbor. But still, Little Bay Islanders went out each day to work their corner of the cod industry. At day's end, they picked their kids up from the schoolhouse and headed over to their local union meetings. When they had a chance, they caught up at the poacher's lounge for a drink. When they made it to the weekend, they headed to the crowded grocery stores and crammed into the town's two churches. When winter turned to spring, they planted root vegetables in home gardens, awaiting the peak summer fishing season. And when they tired after a long career, they handed their work off to their children. At mid-century, Little Bay Islands still happily revolved around the same industry it always had. But while change isn't always continuous, it is inevitable. And soon, intruding engines of change showed up right offshore. It came in the shape of a 280-foot British fair tree trawling vessel appearing off the coast of Newfoundland in 1951. Alongside an invading fleet of smaller trawlers from across Europe, the Soviet Union, and Japan, this would change cod fishing forever. While outsiders weren't new, as fishers from as far as Portugal seasonally visited Little Bay Islands, the technology was. Uh, then, uh, all of a sudden, the draggers got involved where you could drop a net over the stern of a boat or over the side for side trawlers and go out and drag the bottom over, and whatever is in front of that net certainly comes up. There's nothing left. And not only uh, were we taking a lot of cod, but we were taking a lot of bycatch too, because, I mean, if you want a load of cod and there's other things in there, you just throw that back in the ocean dead. In just a decade, traditional methods used by local fishers for generations—hook and line, nets, cod traps—were superseded by floating cities capable of hauling up tons of fish and flash-freezing them, all while still at sea. At the same time that massive ships consolidated the fishing industry, politicians sought to consolidate Canada's coastal population. In an effort to save on expensive government-provided services—ferries, power, healthcare. The Centralization Program of 1954 and the Fisheries Household Resettlement Program of 1965 moved thousands from remote outports to population centers. In the 1950s and 60s, the waters around Little Bay Islands had become overcrowded, and towns not so different from it began feeling pressure to relocate. But not only did Little Bay Islands persist during this period, it thrived. Its docks, shops, processing plants, churches, and school hummed with activity. For the moment, there were enough fish to support both the cities at sea pulling it in by the ton and the town's continued small-scale operations. That moment, however, proved fleeting. With innovation, mechanization, and the ruthless pursuit of efficiency, 
came disaster. By the 1970s, annual fish hauls were tripling the tonnage of those from three decades prior. Cod populations couldn't keep up. With collapse on the horizon, Canadian officials took action, turning back foreign vessels and placing quotas on the fish. But it was far too little, far too late. By 1990, in some spots, one could hardly find the fish at all. Because I fished up Labrador Coast, 500 miles north from where I lived, and they had a moratorium up there for two years, couldn't get a cod to eat. But, you know, there's, uh, like I said, nobody lesson. In 1992, the Canadian government banned nearly all cod fishing. The moratorium aimed to revive the stock over the course of a few years. Today, Nearly 30 years later, the moratorium is still in place. The collapse of the cod industry put Little Bay Islands in an impossible position. The town was, the town is in many ways, a picture-perfect fishing community. Little Bay Islands is one of the most beautiful communities around. It's, uh, it's a, uh, a beautiful harbor there. In fact, there's two inlets there. You can get a small boat one end and big boats for the other. It was an island off, off a harbor, that's what it is. And there's no odds how bad the weather gets, it's still sheltered. And I guess that's one of the reasons why it's not a very big island. People had to go off the island uh, and get enough wood to keep their stoves going and for shipbuilding, that kind of thing, because uh, according to islands out there, it wasn't, it was a small island. But it was located to the fishing grounds, so that was the main thing. Now, though, the most important fish was gone. As an industry, fishing didn't line the pockets of Little Bay Islanders, it didn't create massive financial wealth, but it did support a unique way of life. It nurtured the small town camaraderie that only blooms after decades of waiting together in the same lines, singing the same hymns, and drinking the same draft beers. It furthered family bonds as mothers and fathers taught their trades to daughters and sons. As the rest of the world moved towards urban centers, Little Bay Islands offered an alternative path for those enchanted by a rural, rugged lifestyle deeply entangled with the surrounding landscape. Fishing made it possible, and Little Bay Islands had stayed loyal. The town had no backup plan, no alternative industry to pick up the slack should something go awry. Here, cod was king, and now cod was dead. While fishing stayed a consistent economic driver for centuries, the actual day-to-day -day practice has proved dynamic, requiring flexibility and, at times, mobility. So resettlement is as much a part of outport life in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador as the fishing that, that brought people there in the first place. Some, the earliest seasonal fishing parties and later families relocating in search of better home bases, moved by choice. Others, indigenous peoples and outport communities deemed too far from urban hubs, were pushed or forced to relocate. While Little Bay Islands had dodged resettlement by choice or force for well over a century, by the late 90s, it was becoming difficult to ignore the creeping thought that their time to pull up stakes was quickly arriving. In the years following the moratorium, Little Bay Islanders turned their efforts to crab, fish, and capelin, fish that have kept Newfoundland's economy afloat through to today. Yeah, so while the East Coast cod fishery collapsed, the, what's popularly known as the cod moratorium happened in July of 1992 and is still underway today, I think what people don't realize is that this is still a billion dollar industry fisheries. And in the decade that followed, you had 10% of the population of Newfoundland and Labrador move away. As Little Bay Island's fishers moved to the mainland to find work, institutions that relied on their presence, the grocery stores, churches, and school, began to falter. In 2009, the crab processing plant, the town's last major employer, shuttered, leaving the women who worked the plant little choice but to relocate or rely on unemployment programs. In just a few decades, the bustling town, with boats whizzing past its wharves by day and the poacher's lounge filling to standing room only by night, had taken on a melancholy quiet. As families peeled out of town one by one, the murmurs of whole-scale resettlement gained momentum. In Newfoundland and Labrador, 
The term resettlement is a loaded one. I don't know. Uh, resettlement is a bad word for me. I mean, we did that back in Joey Smarva's day. And it was a terrible thing to do, uprooted people that, you know, that was there all their lives and, and didn't approve their uh, bit, one bit in the world. In the wake of the Cod collapse, the government revived the unpopular mid-century policy in 2010. This time around, the resettlement program offered a proportionally larger payout, prohibited the provincial government from initiating the process, and, if viable, required the community to approve the decision by a 90% vote. Still, more amenable terms aside, such a move was bound to hurt. But I think the reason why it really strikes an emotional chord in Newfoundland and Labrador is because it feels like the death of this way of life. And so, you know, I felt that even when we sold my grandfather's home in Little Bay East on the southern shores of Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, here I had this physical link to a community that my ancestry was tied up in for hundreds of years. And then, you know, for that to be gone and to not be able to have that physical link to a place that I remember growing up and, you know, going with my father to his childhood home and beach combing along the beach and being able to go out in dory with my, my family members, you know, to have that access pulled is more than, you know, let's do something different next year's summer vacation. It's, it's this connection to place and culture and heritage and tradition. And so I think that's difficult for people. Opportunity created Little Bay Islands. When Opportunity died, the town was bound to soon follow. As the Grand Banks clogged with oversized trawlers and fishing transformed from a timeless profession to one with an expiration date, Outport youth began to look west for Opportunity. Often this is what has happened, there's no jobs one time, and the fish is going to go, or even summertime when you're out of school, well, you got a job at a fish plant, working in a fish plant, or you went in a boat with your father, or went down on the wharf cutting out tongues, you made a living. But now there's nothing from to do. Come out of school, there's no, very few places to pick up a job in Newfoundland and Labrador today. In many cases, their own families urged them to move on. Absolutely. I mean, my grandfather was the last fisherman in our family, and that wasn't by accident, that was by design. You know, my grandfather and my grandmother wanted to make sure that their four boys had an education. And certainly Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are all educated, whether that's on the land and sea or in a classroom. But they very much wanted their four boys to receive a classroom education and to go on and have careers that allowed them to leave the outports. As the hope that the fishery would soon recover faded, Little Bay Island's families and youth made their way to the mainland, leaving behind an aging population deeply tied to the landscape, but unmoored from economic opportunities and far from medical services. With the processing plant shuttered, the school empty, the local bar dry, the fire department closed, and the town doctor long gone, Little Bay Islands in 2015 was a shell of its former self. For the 95 aging full-timers, 45 minutes away from medical facilities and grocery stores, assuming fair weather, the time had arrived to put resettlement up for a vote. The result? 85 votes for, 10 against, missing the required 90% benchmark by 0.53%. Four years and zero miracles later, they voted again. This time, it was unanimous. Little Bay Islands would resettle. In the months following the vote, Little Bay Islanders soberly planned their next move, packed their belongings, and, in some cases, converted their homes to operate off-grid, anticipating summer visits. In addition to the $250,000 Canadian dollars Little Bay Islanders were to receive for relocating, they retained their property. Gone, though, were the costly government-supplied amenities. No more power, no more snow plowing, and no more ferry service. Those with unwavering bonds to the place where they grew up, where they raised families, where they felt at home, would be back. But it wouldn't be the same. It couldn't be. As the MV Hazel McIsaac disappeared into the December night, and the Parsons ducked back into their newly off-grid home to ring in the new year, Little Bay Islands entered an era both foreign and familiar. Over were the centuries of permanent settlement and decades of direct connection 
to mainland Canada. Returning, though, was the remoteness and self-sufficiency that defined the outport's earliest days, a uniquely disconnected way of life that drew many to the islands in the first place. In recent years, seasonal visitors, sea kayakers, photographers, authors, and artists have descended upon the striking landscapes and quaint coastal communities of the likes of Little Bay Islands. But fishermen like Winfred Bartlett and grandchildren of fishermen like Jen Thornhill Verma aren't yet ready to agree to the devil's bargain that tourism presents. Back, my family still lives there. As much as I'm proud that people go there to visit, I want people to go and stay for a long time, not just a good time. Staying for a long time, though, requires a healthy fishery. A healthy fishery requires something that Newfoundland outport communities can't procure on their own future-forward, stringent, protective fishing policy at the national and international level. Outports today, while built on a foundation of enterprising and independent spirit, bend to global forces. But then again, Little Bay Islands and outports like it have always been at the mercy of economics and politics well beyond their wharves, spanning the northern Atlantic and beyond. It's likely too late for Little Bay Islands, but this doesn't have to be the end for outports. The lesson of Little Bay Islands is not that these places rural, small town lifestyle can't exist. Instead, it's that it can't exist in a vacuum. While proudly independent and situated well on the periphery, the survival of these extremities hinges on their relationships and ties to the center. And while the people of outports get to decide when they resettle, it's much larger forces that will decide if they have to. I really hope you enjoyed this first ever episode of Extremities. The second episode is up now. We're going to be releasing another episode next week, then more every three weeks after that. However, that third episode, the one going up next week, is available right now on Nebula, a streaming platform built by creators to give their viewers the best possible viewing experience. As Nebula doesn't have an algorithm, we don't have to worry about releasing the third episode now and having a month-long gap until the fourth. We do on YouTube, so this is just one of the countless ways creators experiment on there. We also release extended cuts of normal videos, companion videos, make big-budget Nebula originals, and publish all our normal videos early and ad-free. If you enjoyed Extremities here, you're going to like it even more on Nebula. Best of all, the best way to get access to Nebula is through the Curiosity Stream bundle deal. This also gets you access to their enormous library of high-quality nonfiction shows and documentaries. For example, you could watch Origins of Land, which explores how continents formed by looking at one of the newest pieces of land formed by volcanic eruptions over the past few decades. Altogether, Curiosity Stream and Nebula is an unbeatable pair for any Extremities viewer, and it comes at an unbelievable price — just $14.79 a year at current sale pricing for both combined. Best of all, signing up at curiositystream.com ext helps support Extremities and all these other independent creators, and your support will never be more needed than now as we launch this channel to make sure it's something sustainable that we can continue long into the future.